Uh, so what I'm presenting today is some kind of ramblings and thoughts that I had while I was working in the FLAME project, uh, which is an ERC project um, led by the University of Oxford uh, by Professor Mark Pollard. So what this project is about is about uh, trying to understand the movement of uh, Metal, uh, the movement, the connection of metal across Eurasia in the third and second millennium we see. So to achieve this aim, uh, we collected a um, lot of data. Basically, we have uh, 60,000 chemical data on uh, metal artifacts. And this collection uh, is going to be um, available online. So uh, the project is developing a, a web GIS app um, where not only there would be available all these chemical analysis but also uh, the tools that uh, we are creating so some of them are based on what I'm talking today uh, but more uh, complex and possibly um, elegant uh, tools are currently being developed by John Pancet and Mary Sanders so <clears throat> The idea is actually how to try to um, basically visualize this, uh, this data. And I would like to start from um, the um, old uh, examples that I had. So <clears throat> the problem is how to uh, visualize uh, big data sets like 50,000 uh, um, analysis on a large scale. And uh, we have examples of one of the um, biggest uh, project that has been uh, um, done in, uh, in Europe. Um, this was the work of the, um, some, a group of researchers based in uh, Stuttgart that worked in the 60s and 70s, and they analyzed something like 20,000 um, objects, metal objects dated to the prehistory. And, um, and then this is how they decided to visualize their results, geographically speaking. Uh, what they did was creating this kind of um, maps, uh, subdividing the geographic space of Europe with polygons that are determined by a mixture of modern boundaries, um, of topographic elements, of, of visual uh, perception of the fact that there are some zones that have more artifacts and, and some zones that have less artifacts. And then they created a shade of gray um, according to the percentage of um, presence of some kind of composition of metal. So in this case was arsenic copper. But since then, that was kind of interesting approach, but since then what's happening within the archaeometallurgical um, community is this. That's on a map, distribution maps, and that's all. And, uh, well, they, they are useful, I'm not saying that. And then from this kind of maps, though, um, basically, this is created. So basically, they use distribution maps to try to understand where there are highest concentration of specific, um, of specific, uh, sorry, specific chemistry, and then they draw their lines. These lines are not invented. You know, you can uh, you can see um, the explanation of these lines in the text, but when you see the map, you can't really argue with map, you just have to take it as it is. All right, this is the movement, I, I agree with that, or not. Mm. So what I'm trying to uh, find is a way to uh, visualize this kind of movement, or maybe not even the movement, let's call a diffusion of metal of a specific composition um, in different ways. So I'm presenting here um, two case studies. One is um, arsenic copper in the copper age. So from the third um, 3300 BC to 2300 BC in, uh, in Europe. And the other is uh, bronzes, so copper with tin in the early bronze age, so from 2200 to 1500 BC in, uh, in Europe. So yeah, let's start with the first case study. And let's start from the beginning. Distribution maps, as we said, a uh, little more elegant, so with the size of the dots that indicates how many objects there are in each site. And basically, looking at this map, 
you can see that there is well, concentration here, and then that there is a distribution more or less in all Europe, apart from maybe in this zone, there is less objects. Uh, to try to really understand this distribution, probably what you need to do is also compare it with the distribution of your total assemblage with all the meta or objects, or the one that has been analyzed, let's say. Um, well, so if you compare the two maps, then you can maybe start to see the difference in France, but it's really hard to capture the difference between a distribution of a specific composition with respect to distribution of the total assemblage, just by eyes. Um, so with the group of Oxford, we developed a tool, very simple, it's called ubiquity analysis, and this basically calculates the percentage of objects that have a specific uh, composition with respect of the total assemblage. Now, of course, we can't do the total assemblage because then we have only Europe with one gray color. Um, so the, the trick here is create some kind of sub-assemblage and then see the differences in this kind of uh, percentage in the different sub-assemblage. Um, in this case, the sub-assemblage will be the, defined by uh, the geography. So to create my sub-assemblage, I need to define a grid. And we can start to think about which grid and how to aggregate our data. So the easiest uh, example that I had in mind was using regular grids. Um, these are hexagons with 15 kilometers of um, side. And using ubiquity maps, I don't know if you can see really with the color, with the screen, but you can start to see that it's really a um, higher percentage here in the Iberian Peninsula and then the creating in the eastern part of, um, of Europe. So here, there were a lot of dots, but if you consider the importance of this group, it's not so much. Um, why I'm talking about ubiquity analysis? Because basically, if you think about having 15 objects that have arsenic copper, it's kind of a difference between having these 15 objects in a site that have a total of 18 objects or a total of 500 objects. Because in the first case, it's really telling you about the fact that they are connected somehow to a center of production that is creating this kind of, um, of metal composition. In the second case, it's coming from somewhere, but it's not really an important connection between uh, the center of production of this kind of composition. Now, okay, I can see this with this map, but the problem with this uh, regular grid is this. Basically, for a statistic point of view, of course, I needed to exclude all the um, sub polygon all the hexagons that had um, less than, let's say, five objects, because otherwise, I, if I have just a single find, I will have 100% or 0% objects um, with a specific composition and would be very misleading. So the problem is that then you are excluding a lot of dots, a lot of data of your data sets just because they are sparse. So what I've done was creating a little Python script, a little tool that uh, was able to create an irregular grid that is um, able to basically include in each polygon at least 10 artifacts. So the positivity of this kind of um, aggregation is that finally your entire data set is there. You don't need to um, exclude your data just because they are sparse. And visually speaking, I think it's really powerful because you can have, you know, you have a general picture. You don't have just uh, dots, spares here and there. But there are issues, um, nevertheless, with this kind of map. Um, well, the first issue, the first bigger issue is that, again, visually speaking, you tend to believe that the biggest polygon is the most important, whereas what it's saying you is that there are very sparse objects. and. Uh, sites where you have, I don't know, 20 or 30 artifacts are really small. So this is a kind of problem. Um, of course, it's empathizing the um, edge problems, like this is the end of my data set, sorry. <laughs> I have only so few artifacts in there. Um, and there is another, um, let's say, issue, a disadvantage, is that with regular grids, the grid remains the same, so it's easier to make comparison between different data sets and different time 
set. Whereas uh, with this kind of, of, of map, every time you are adding new data, in theory, you should redo the polygon map. Um, so there are contra and, uh, and pro with this kind of thing. Uh, third way to go that I thought was get rid of the grids altogether and try to build up some um, continuous maps. So since we are talking about the ratio of the kind of composition versus the total assemblage, what I tried to do was using kernel density and using kernel density with a specific composition with the total assemblage and then making a ratio. So this is the result, but then this morning I was realizing that maybe it's not really very visible, so I made another map which is exactly the same. So um, I, I'm maintaining the purple for consistence of color, but maybe this is easier to read. And here you can really start to see um, how is it important in the uh, Iberian Peninsula, but not the total of the Iberian Peninsula. You can perceive really effectively the gap here in France, and I know why, because I know that there is a mine here that was producing another type of metal. Um, so what was going on here was that there was a production here probably that was not passing the barrier of, let's say, of France, because here there was another circulation of metal. And then in the Alps there was a production that was not as intense as here of this kind of composition uh, that was also including uh, Central Alp. Here it's kind of interesting, this little focus, because I know that there was a mine that was producing um, metal with arsenic and timony, but apparently also a little bit of uh, just arsenic. So with the knowledge that I know about uh, mines, I can see that this map really makes some kind of sense, um, which is good. Uh, I would like to focus a little bit on, on Spain, because with this kind of map, we are back with the purple, um, I was really able to uh, try to perceive this kind of a movement from the Atlantic region and the central part of Spain, um, possibly uh, with the help of these two rivers that are Taco and Guadiana. So there is a sort of connection between the Atlantic world and the uh, central part of Spain, whereas the northern and southern region of Spain seem, seems to have a kind of a different story. I know that there were um, production of metal in these two regions as well, so they were not so well interconnected as uh, what was going on in the um, Atlantic part and the central part. So I think it was a it, it's visually powerful way to, uh, to see this. Uh, second case study, um, bronzes in the uh, Bronze Age. So again, let's start with the distribution map. And here it's maybe even more difficult, but basically you can see, well, it's the Bronze Age for a fact, so there is bronzes everywhere. And um, I, really connecting it with the um, distribution of the total assemblage, it's even harder to get if there are some zones in which bronzes is more important than, uh, than objects without tin. <coughs> so again, we can start with the ubiquity with the regular grid. And now you can see that even if, like in this region, there were a lot of objects, actually it was not a region where there was a lot of objects with tin in proportion. And whereas here there is, well, the British Isles and then France, especially southern France, the western part of Italy, here, the Atlantic region and the Balkans were region in which there were more objects that have um, tin with respect of the total assemblage, of course. Now, you know the game, irregular grids again. Um, and with irregular grids, again, you can have a sort of more, how can I say, easier way to see through all Europe what was going on. Um, is usually of more impact, let's say, um, now, what I've done with tin, I was also interested in the average of tin. Why? Because basically, if you think about 
a center of production that is close to a mine of tin, then objects may have a higher percent of tin because they are fresh made objects. Um, whereas moving away from the center of production, maybe what was happening was that bronzes, objects with tin, were mixed with objects that don't have tin. And as a result, you will have a depletion of tin. So these are known tin mines in Europe. So this, this, part, this in Portugal are mines that, known, uh, that have been exploited also in the past. This is a little more debated, and this as well, there is some people that think it's, oh, sorry, that has been done, and some people don't. So, sorry, I'm accelerating. So this is the map of the average of tin, and I've used the map that I've made uh, with my little tool, because then I was sure that I had at least uh, 10 objects, so the average of tin was making some kind of sense. And there is a nice correspondence, again, between the known mines here and here, and the uh, regions that have a lot of tin, that's, uh, that have tin that have a um, higher percentage. Um, and then I've made, again, a continuous surface. And this time I've used Kriging, using the value of tin to do it. And it's visually of impact, and I can see, again, this connection between regions that have known tin mines and um, objects that have a higher level of tin. And here I can see again appearing this connection between the um, Atlantic world and the central part of, um, of Spain, which I think is interesting. What else? Um, here in the western part of, of, of the um, Alps, there is an ongoing debate about if tin was coming from here or from here. Uh, but this mine that, as I said, was kind of debated, was it exploited or not? Looking at this map, I can think that it was exploited, but it was not distributing so much the, um, the tin that was exploited here. Whereas the mine here in Tuscany, there is a little focus here, so I may imagine that actually, again, that w there was an exploitation, but there was not um, higher distribution of this kind of uh, material. So these are just the three maps altogether, the um, mines of tin, the ubiquity, so how many objects have tin, and the percentage of, of tin. Again, I would like to focus on Spain, because I think it's really interesting to see this kind of connection, both in the copper age with arsenic copper, and then in the bronze age with, with, um, with bronzes. And I think that you know, using this map, you can really think about um, how these uh, people were uh, living here in the, in the Atlantic region and people working here in the, in the central part of Spain were interconnected through time. Conclusion. Conclusions? Well, I don't have a conclusion in the sense that I don't want to give you a Bible or a procedure that must be done to uh, visualize chemical data. I think that what I wanted to say is that there are many uh, different tools, and many are going to be um, you know, created now, and I think that each tool can give us some kind of information. So uh, I wanted also to know about you if you have something more in, in your mind, and, um, and we can discuss about how um, visualize one, the same thing in different way can give us different piece of information. This is exactly the same data sets, visualizing four different ways. And again, you can see here arsenic copper, you can find it more or less everywhere. This is an information that it's not so evident maybe using ubiquity, but ubiquity can tell you how much was important. And that's all. <laughs>